Hello, everybody. We are live again here at the Equine Touch studio. So please do let us know when you uh, join us and where you're joining us from. And we're just going to make sure the technology is working and that we have some listeners before we start talking with our um, wonderful presenter today, Claire Shand from Westgate Labs. And uh, whilst we're waiting for some more people to come on, just to let you know that Claire is the reason that I am here doing this for all you guys, because she inspired me to get involved in this, having uh, done a promotion for um, her own business and around tales behind the tests, which is a really great facility if you want to check out her website. So we're just going to wait until a few people have uh, clocked on. So, Claire, how are you feeling just now whilst we're waiting for some viewers? Yeah, I'm good. Thanks, Chris. Um, thanks very much for inviting us on tonight to talk about wormer resistance. Uh, yeah. Yeah, it's good to be here. And it's the second thing you've done today because you were down at the Agricultural College this morning getting the students involved in actually doing some tests. That's right. Yeah, we were at Kirkley Horning. We were doing wormer counts and equisile tests for all of horses and the um, Morpeth RTA that's based there as well so yeah and um, with a really good bunch of students talking about wormer resistance and getting them to understand like why the testing is important and mm -hmm. then yeah actually getting out and doing them in minus three and a half degrees so, yeah we were keeping warm <laughs> bustling around with that one that will be cold that will be cold and I've been involved a bit in doing the test myself Claire well not the important parts but squidging the squidging the poo samples yes. and making them ready for the uh for the old um what centrifuge isn't it that's right yeah doing the stomaching of the process yeah yeah all yeah. hands on deck at times isn't it <laughs> yeah hi amanda thank you for joining us we're just going to wait and see when a few more people can tune in so we're joined today with uh by claire shand who's been the director of marketing and communications for uh westgate labs and uh, Claire's has over 20 years experience in uh, in the field uh, and headed up marketing teams for badminton horse trials British Equestrian, British Dressage. Hi, Leander, all the way from Holland. Lovely to see you. And, uh, and was also press attaché for the Equestrian and Modern Pentathlon um, teams in the 2012 London Olympics, which you have a great few stories for, Claire, but we're not here to hear those today. <laughs> and it did mean I got a great ticket for the uh, Dressage to Music Finals at Greenwich. Thank you very much for, for that. So that was great. That's what and, friends for, hey? Yeah, yeah. And then you've been uh, with the business uh, since 2015. You've come and joined the family business that your mum and dad set up back in 1999 with your dad. I, I, and I've known you since, well, I was thinking this morning, it's nearly 30 years, Claire. Since I you know were it is, there. right? Scary, scary. Yeah, yeah all, all the way back then, we were still using the testing with our own horses. And then uh -huh. it wasn't until... You know, we were wondering, well, why is other people not doing this? That mm -hmm. my dad, who's a scientist and an entrepreneur, he decided, well, if no one else is, then we could offer this service. So, yeah, he, when we were teenagers, he was the one that was going around the collecting rings, picking up poop of other ponies and being a really embarrassing dad um, just to see whether other ponies had parasite problems because we were testing our own horses. We weren't finding anything. So we didn't know, is it a bigger problem? And do other horses have worms? And actually, yeah. when we took the test back and we tested them ourselves, like they really did. They had wormer counts of thousands and oh. we couldn't test people. But we knew then that actually, uh, you know, we obviously know a lot more now that such a ubiquitous problem. I mean, worldwide. So, you know, great to see you, Jolanda, from Holland. And yeah. this is something that all horse owners struggle with. Yeah, yeah, because I was thinking that it, it would be a worldwide problem, but I suppose different countries maybe would they have slightly different parasites or or just no different... same. Oh really? Yeah, so yeah, we're really looking at the same culprits worldwide, and particularly now that we get more movement across different, um, you know, Europe and international, that um, those parasites and those resistant parasites, more importantly, they're traveling, you know, they're going with our horses, and then they're infecting oh. other herds, and so it's an even bigger issue and particularly as we get global warming as well, like climate change is actually going to be really bad for parasite control. So in yeah. temperate areas now where there's not so many seasons, but it's warmer and wetter, they're already seeing greater parasite challenge. You know, we're lucky currently in that our winters and our summers, you know, colder and yeah. drier, hotter and drier, they're not so good for parasites. Whereas as we get wetter and warmer and everything, you know, gets more motile on our pastures that's bad news unfortunately 
Yeah. And I, yeah. and I was thinking, you know, that part of this cold snap, we're currently in the UK at the moment with a little bit of snow, that that's what we've needed, really, because it's been such a, a warm um, up until this point. So we haven't been able to do the red worm satisfactorily to, to do that. And we can talk about that a bit later on, about the timing of doing these things, can't we? We Yeah, we can. Yeah. And I mean, it's very much down to like, you can't just provide a date. It's about looking out of you know what's actually going out there on the pasture and mm -hmm do that because we've had such a mild warm autumn we've mm -hmm. seen the parasite activity correspond to that so yeah it's a good job we're having this now brilliant in the uk brilliant. for sure right claire well just to remind you claire's the director of marketing communications at westgate labs and uh, you've got a great presentation claire with some fantastic slides which uh, are part of your design background so mm -hmm. I, I, hopefully i'll get to your skill level maybe in another 20 years so oh, bless you. Thanks. Make sure you all of the slides and then uh, any questions from anybody, please uh, post us your questions. That would be fantastic. And do let us know as you join where you're joining from, because it's always good to hear where where we've got friends coming from from all around the world. Off you go, Claire. Thanks. Yeah, super. Thanks, Chris. Um, yeah, well, what a great introduction. Um, I'll just get some slides up. Are we are you going to do that bit, Chris? Oh, you want me to put the slides up? Oh, I thought you I, don't, I think you have to put them up and then I can, go. I can drive now. But you're in okay. control over this bit, I think. Okay, so, you yeah. Type it in. Um, brilliant. Yeah, we're all good. Um, yeah, we're here to talk about wormer resistance and something that is actually, you know, really, really important for us as horse owners. It's one of the biggest problems that we've got that's currently facing the veterinary industry. And although we've got all these fantastic developments in, um, particularly, um, you know, competition horses, lameness, and everything else, all these exciting areas actually like if we don't get this parasite control right then we're really going to be in a pickle which is what i really want to talk about um this evening um so yeah i mean parasites themselves um, horses can deal very well with them in low numbers but it's really um when they get to um higher infection levels that we can really start to see the symptoms and once we start to see the symptoms it means that they're already a big infection present there and um, we really need to get on top of it before they start to cause these things like um, weight loss so tapeworm in particular they don't feed off the horse they eat the actual you know, all that expensive competition mix that we're putting in our horses that um, they can cause colics that's from impactions particularly things like ascarid are very big worms to find um, in the young horses that they particularly target um, so you can get impactions and blockages from their insisted small red worm and they can cause colics which are very very difficult to treat because you have an active colic but you also have these emerging larval and um, kind of stages of these small red worm and this bloody diarrhea that's going on um, and often that can lead to death unfortunately for horses and um, in young foals scouring and things like um, just you know ill thrift and not doing well gut disruptions coughing ascarid and things like um, lungworm have a migratory phase where the worms actually travel from the intestines through the tissues and they cause coughing and that can have long-lasting respiratory damage things like that and then ultimately death unfortunately so this is what we're really up against um, when we talk about parasite infection and the problems that we're about to encounter as our worm has become less effective so there's no new wormers in development um, and that's what we're going to go on and look at. So first of all, just a little bit of a basic understanding of like what actually is the parasite infection? Where is it coming from? So the adult worms, they actually live in the belly of the horse. So they're all there um, and reproducing and they can kick out like tens of thousand eggs in a day. Wow. And these eggs get passed out feces and then they are um, basically in the droppings that our horses lay in the fields and the worms uh, eggs will hatch sort of you know around sort of five seven eight days something like that into these tiny little larvae and if you're a worm larvae your aim in life is to get back inside of a horse to grow on and continue your life cycle because preservation is what you're after so these tiny little motile larvae will hatch they want to wriggle away from the dung because horses don't really like grazing around their own dung and get as far away as possible and then this little picture here never fails to amaze me this um the, in the little circle there that's a dew drop on a blade of grass and those tiny little larvae in there are all hanging out on that um, blade of grass ready to be eaten by a horse as oh, it comes around on the pasture how long will they go claire from the dung then 
It really depends on temp on the um the dryness. So like in um dry conditions, a small redworm larvae can get about a meter from a pile of dung, but in wow. the wet they can travel up to three meters. So like that's like a, that's a, a big area for a tiny worm to travel and it means the further they get from the latrine areas of the field the pasture where the horses are grazing the more likely they are to get back inside of a horse right right so and i remember you told me in the gun under the hedge when i was putting the dung out under the hedge because you said it that it will just the, the larvae will just come back onto the onto the grass yeah, and if you've got a muck heap, for example, that's just in the next neighbouring fields, that is a ready source of infection if it's not far enough away. So, you know, if you're just putting the dung into a corner of a field, it's undoing all your hard work as those larvae are wriggling back out and back onto the pasture as infection uh -huh. risk. Wow. So, yeah, understanding more about what's on your pasture, what sort of eggs you've got there by doing the testing and understanding the level of infection risk, really, that you're putting your horses at from grazing is really important. And we're going to go on and talk a bit about parasite um, pasture management as well and how that can influence it. Mm -hmm. So that's what's going on. These worm eggs are in the environment. They're all around us. And so it's really about how do we manage that risk for horses? And it came about that horses kick out so many worm egg eggs in a day uh, because of how they uh, began in terms of wild horses. So they grazed these thousands of acres over like ranging over large acreages. And there was other things as well coming along. So uh, um, it could be a sheep, a goat, a woolly mammoth, something like that coming along and eating that blade of grass. The parasites are usually species specific. And so if one of those worm eggs larvae gets back into one of those species, then they're toast. So they're, th that's it. So in order for survival, they got so that they would um, produce so many eggs, which means that there's much more likelihood that actually they would end up back in the right host species and be able to carry on their life cycle. And yeah. so this evolution that we've had now with in domestication really plays into the hands of the parasites and makes our horses much higher risk because we tend to keep them in these confined areas they graze back over the same land over and over and it's horses generally just in one field with and single species which then makes it much more uh, prone to to infection and that's what we're up against and why we're getting these issues that we're seeing with our horses um and this is what we've got to treat them. I mean, it looks like a myriad of different wormers, but actually mm. when we boil it down, there are actually only five chemicals that we've got licensed for horses. And one of the biggest problems that we've got are there aren't any more in development. So the most recent ones that you'll recognize here are ivermectin moxidectins, which actually came about kind of, you know, late 80s, 90s. You know, there are, there are new ones, um, but they came across from agriculture and the latest ones that have been developed for sheep and um, other food producing animals are actually toxic to horses and we're not able to use them. So that's where the development is. It's not unfortunately in the horse market because it just isn't the money in it to license these products because it costs so much money. Mm -hmm. So we've got these things here, like the um, benzmidazoles, which actually you'll recognize as Panica, as its kind of, you know, um, brand name. Have they, they've kind of been around since the 60s. So a long, long time and a lot of exposure, which is where we get into the problem, because this was the historical practice of worming. You know, they got these new chemicals. They were able to save all these horses who were getting impacted by these parasite infections. And suddenly we had this great answer. It was worm every eight weeks, kill the worms, everything will be great, and like off we go. Yeah. And um, that was until we realized that actually all we were doing was exposing them to um, the chemicals, um, to the worms, and then they were developing this resistance, which is a heritable ability. That means that it's a genetic mutation that the worm develops against the chemical, and it means they pass this genetic ability on their. Um, offspring. So a worm is said to be resistant if it, it survives exposure to the standard dose and it never regains that. So once you've got resistance, it doesn't go back, unfortunately. Okay. And it's so it's always going to be resistant. Exactly. Yeah. So if you if a horse, for example, gets panico resistance or the, the land, then the worms on that land are, are never going to react again to panico. It's always going to be something that 
um, they can just tolerate and survive, unfortunately. Right. And that's something that happens gradually over time. So the horse has to be exposed to that in order for those worms to begin to develop that resistance. And to begin with, a, a wormer has to be around sort of 95 percent effective to, in order to get a license and so there'll always be a few that survive a treatment and gradually over time these are the ones that are given the space and the time to develop so that you gradually get this increasing population of worms that are resistant and it's the horse pasture that becomes resistant and then they don't respond to treatment and then that's when the horses that are kept there become at high risk of this disease from untreatable parasite infections. And we've seen this already in places like Australia and South Africa, where they've used an awful lot of these wormers in sheep farming, that then they got land where actually they couldn't put sheep anymore because the sheep just succumbed and died um, to these parasite burdens and they couldn't treat them. So we've seen it already in other species. And this is where we're headed um, with our wormers. And That's interesting so I hadn't really thought of it as in relation excuse me as in relation to the fact that 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 the worms on that pasture are now resistant yeah. as opposed to all worms are resistant to that chemical so it's really exactly yeah so so if you traveled a horse from that place to another it's probably going to take some of those resistant worms with it oh. and, in, and increase that population but actually it's in that that land if you go back that life cycle you know the land is very much involved in the development of the resistance to those chemicals and that's where those eggs and the larvae are all kind of um centered around you know then you have these resistant parasites on the land and then you think about the livery yards and the businesses and the places where we keep horses now some of which have been in the families for generations if you suddenly couldn't keep horses there you know on your own land or and you're the place that's near to you that it, you love and is dear then we're in a real pickle really and we're heading this way if we carry on as we are it within years not decades the parasitologists are telling us so i mean this is really kind of like becoming a looming issue so that's why we really need to um talk about this um, and get the message out there to s slow this exposure and buy ourselves some time and this is where uh -huh. we're at with these five chemicals. So this looks like a pretty confusing um, or quite a busy table. But if you look down the left hand side there, we've got the five chemicals that we introduced earlier. So fenbendazole there at the top being the oldest, um, or ivermectins, moxidectins. And then across the top there, these are all the parasites that we're looking to treat. And where we've got the ticks in the boxes, oh, thanks, Chris, let make it a bit bigger. Where we've got the ticks in the boxes, that's where the license has, have been granted in order to um, for those to be effective. However, there's only the, they're still effective um, where they're green and where we've got these colours creeping in. That's where we're showing that actually resistance has started to develop or actually is fairly advanced when we get to the pink side of things. So if we look in this first column here, we're looking at our adult small red worm, which is the most predominant parasite we'll find around the world in horses. Like 95% of horse worm burdens are likely to be these because they're just so, um, their life cycle so short at like four to five weeks. And also they're just so tenacious. And you'll see there that we don't actually have a chemical of all the four that are licensed for it that isn't showing some level of resistance, which that's a, a real, real worry for us. And then yeah. particularly when we go to the second column there the insisted small red worm that we talked about they're the larval ones that can cause that really dangerous colic then actually again we've we haven't got um a you know a very effective um chemical left um moxidectin is our most effective that's the one that we really you know key medicine we really need to preserve but you know again there's only two treatments and one of those is pretty ineffective now that five day fenbendazole that we've got so all this really sh starts to show that you know we're really up against it with the chemicals and then we know moxidectin as um well particularly the combination of moxidectin praziquantel wormer that in this country you'll be familiar with as a quest pramox as the wormer that does everything is really yeah. you know what we know it as but if you look along the line there to where we've got roundworm um, and that's the ascarid, then you can see there that against ivermectin and moxidectin, we've got this pink colour there, which really shows that 
um, commonly reported resistance to that. Um, Ascarids really um, not very effective treatment for them at all. So we now need to really look at which parasites we're targeting and what chemical we're going to use in order to get the best effect for that, which is uh -huh. what we want to talk about. So what it really means then um, for equestrian properties is that um, we're going to have resistant parasites because they've all been exposed to these wormers. So we can't just come along and give a wormer and expect that it's going to work. So the thing really is to reduce our reliance on the chemicals and also in the same vein, start looking for the resistance. Like, where is the trouble? Because that's the thing is we know that there are resistant parasites, but there's been so few studies done and we're not really um, looking on our own land and to see, well, where is the chemical resistance and um, are our wormers being effective? Right, right. So... The good news, there is some good news in horse parasites, um, is that the testing is the thing that is really on our side. And there's more and more development going into this, which is fantastic. So we've got our worm accounts the, on the left there, really the sort of cornerstone of any horse targeted worming program um, that we're going to do. And they're going to help us to reduce wormer use by up to 82 percent which is yeah. fantastic if we're going to do those regularly um so that's really the cornerstone the humble wormer count um you know if you do no other testing that's that'll be the first one to pick up really um if you're not doing that already with your horses then we'll go over to the right hand side the equisol test for tapeworm um is a really fantastic test it came on board in 2015 has absolutely revolutionized our thinking of tapeworm treatment we know now that fewer than 30% of horses need a treatment for tapeworm. So that's a lot of horses that we're getting treatment don't need it anymore. Conversely, we also find, and I found it with my own horse, Teddy, that actually quite a few horses who have a high tapeworm burden need a bit more of a test treat regime in order to get on top of a high tapeworm burden. And this is because A, the tapewormers that we've got target generally the adults, not the larval stages. So if you take those out, there's often a larval Blues, um, yeah good word thank you um ready to come on and take over also we know that where we've got a lot of tapeworm present like on the pasture for example um then you can get reinfection taking place there really easily so it breaking that life cycle is harder partly because the tapeworm have an intermediate host of this orobatid mite like a little grassland mite which eats the egg and then is running around the pasture so more difficult than just poo picking because we can't target those directly and they're all part of the ecosystem so it's yeah that's an interesting one and i remember that you guys were part of the development of the to see the effectiveness of that equisile test weren't you claire because when you're testing the horses and then they were testing them on horses that then were having were being put down for whatever reason and then that's right yeah so it is tested at post-mortem level mm -hmm. yeah they're going and looking it's just rem let people know how that was done because it really isn't i mean i had a horse that that ended up having colic and uh, and all sorts of repercussions for that going and having colic surgery and everything and uh, and that was um they reckoned was tapeworm um mm -hmm. you know and damage in the small intestine which caused the blockage so uh, yeah. and, and, and again i wasn't really paying attention and the horse wasn't with me and so sometimes when you're not in control or, or your horse is being looked after by someone else you sort of sometimes forget about these things and it's it's so important to make sure that you can do these tests and to, and to make sure you get them done by someone who you trust, I think. Yeah, definitely. I think the tapeworm one is a really interesting one because some vets are a little bit um, dismissive in terms of like, you know, are we overworming for tapeworm? I would agree, but it can cause damage, obviously, as you're well aware, because mm -hmm. if they hang out in the ileocecal junction of the horse, so they're all tending to be gathered in this one juncture of the small intestine, which means that then you can get blockages, you can get irritations, and that leads to colic. And we all know colic in horses is very unpredictable. And, you know, there are obvious impacts from that which um just by testing and being more aware you can help hopefully prevent these illnesses and and worse unfortunately developing so yeah mm -hmm. really really key and um something to do but every six months rather than um the frequency of the worm egg counts because the tapeworm is slower growing um right. and then the next thing which is really exciting is the um, blood test now available that detects the insisted stages of small redworm too. So 
Whereas the WOMEG counts are really monitoring the adults, you know, they are obviously adults because they're egg laying and they're not secreted away into the gut wall um, because they're out and in the gut. Um, what we can't do is detect these with the worm egg counts, detect these um, in sister stages. They're the larvae that inhibit in the gut wall and burrow away there. And they can overwinter for up to, well, up to three years. They can be there previously undetectable until now we have this blood test. It's a serology, which is monitoring like the Equisile test, the antibodies the horse is producing against these parasites and then is able to then um, detect the levels and whether you actually need to worm or not. So fantastic just development. Be clear, Claire, that, that blood test, that insisted stage is what we would normally be worming at or, or looking for at this time of year after the cold snap. It is. That's right. Yeah. So the the small red worm, generally, most of the species have this inhibited stage where they will then um, as a larvae, they'll go inside the horse. And then before they're ready to be egg laying, they will burrow into the gut wall and they'll stay for like 10, um, 14 days usually until they're mature, come out and begin egg laying. But when the red worm activity ceases or slows on the pasture, it doesn't cease altogether, then in the wintertime when the temperatures drop, so below six degrees ish, um, which is what we're looking for consistently, you know, in order to then and preserve themselves you know that it's hard work out there they'll stay actually in the gut wall um inhibited there for much longer and this is the danger period because when you get a large burden of those secreted into the gut wall not only do you then have the risk of damage intestinal scarring which can limit nutrient uptake and things like that but you can also then have this mass emergence and that's what kicks off this um like very dangerous colitis colic to treat Mm -hmm. um from the larval cyathostomonosis which then you get a bloody diarrhea you get an active colic and it's really difficult to treat because um you've got so much going on in the horse and this trauma basically that's in the gut and um this is what we really want to guard against and yeah. they think that this is usually triggered by the lengthening of the days and the warming in the spring because actually if you're a worm and like horses obviously are a nomadic and it's very difficult as a we've already discussed as a parasite to get back inside a horse but actually if the group is then um a herd is gathered for foaling then and you can time that right if you can do a mass emergence and suddenly put this bird like new burden onto the pasture of these um so the larvae mass emerge into the gut there's all this egg laying the eggs go onto the pasture the larvae are then can get back inside you can really sort of um, push on your population growth I guess as a species if you can time it right with this gathering of the herd in the evolutionary process that's one of the um, kind of uh, ex explanations that I've heard um, which okay. kind of makes sense I guess um, uh -huh. but uh, really really that blood test when they when they've had how many clear tests for the normal Yes, yeah, so it's recommended only the low risk horses that we test for that currently. So if you've had good clear worm egg counts of up to 200 eggs per gram through the season, then you would be a candidate for doing that. The recommendation currently is that if they are um, have had medium or higher counts, that you're just going to want to give your treatment now for your insisted red worm in the winter rather than relying on the blood test. But I think, you know, we're going to know more about this as we do more with it. Currently, it's for vet interpretation as to whether they think you need to treat or not and um, I think there is well I know there is also a saliva version of this in development so all these things are kind of coming and helping us with you know it's, it's emerging technology isn't it so yeah uh, but um, I think one of the things to mention is that is that um you know some horses are going to be more susceptible than others and I know in in my experience of, of oyster when he was 25 I didn't realize that um, as they get older, the immune system's not as efficient and they're gonna be more likely to have worm burdens. And it did end up with colic for him. Um, and he wasn't put down from that, but it was towards the end of his life anyway. But I remember, you know, it was something was non-specific. The, the, the uh, painkillers he was giving didn't seem to be touching it. And the first thing I did is went off to your mum with, a, with a, a sample and she counted it and it was like 2,500 or something something and so it just gives you a better idea of what's going on and Artie had that temperature at Christmas once and I again I was being offered all these um antibiotics by the vet and I just wasn't sure 
uh, because it wasn't clear what it was. It wasn't actually a colic, but he wasn't eating, but he had a high temperature. So we had the, uh, you know, the pain relief. And then I went to, you know, luckily it's 15 minutes up the road and he was 5,000. And we could then do a, um, you know, worm him. And then I thought the thing I then was obsessed about his temperature. And then, as you say, two weeks after we'd wormed him, we then got another spike in his temperature. He didn't go off his, he didn't go off his food again, but there was obviously that emergence of the ones that were, you know, sitting in the gut that weren't, that weren't happening. So once all the adults were killed, these other ones sort of started coming out. So it's, you do a reduction test, don't you, where you check two weeks after worming to see whether or what the worm burden is still and how effective That's it is. right, yeah. And we'll, we'll go on to talk about that and how we monitor, has it been effective? But just okay. to go back to your first point, yeah, I think it's really interesting that um, often we'll test herds of horses and um, they come back with very varying results you know, they're all kept the same, they're on the same field, the management's identical. And that's actually something that's really normal, that we'll find that 80% of the worms are in 20% of the horses. And it means that then we can really target the treatments actually where we need them. So blanket treatments are so out, you know, we, um, we, it just means that lots of horses getting a chemical they actually don't need because of this 80-20 rule. And, you know, and, and as you said, it can be immune system. So if you've got younger, particularly um, up to sort of three, four years old, immature immune systems make horses very susceptible to parasite infection. As mm -hmm. horses get older, again, their immune system decline. They may also have other health things going on. So wherever you've got something that's taking resource of the immune system and challenging it, you're also going to get a horse that's more susceptible to parasite infection. So if you've got um, a PPID, Cushing's horse, for example, an EMS, a laminitis, ulcer sometimes, anything systemic that's impacting the horse, you'll then find that there's a potential for increased parasite infection with it. So um yeah. certainly uh, sorry carry on i was going to say certainly with a horse that's always had low worm egg counts for example and then suddenly the counts start rising for no other reason well could it be that there's an early like you know there's a cushing's onset or something like that there's what what else is going on so it can be like a barometer of health for the horse's immune system yeah. uh, because you get to know your horse so um but as well as immune, it could also be behavioural. So greedy horses that graze closer to piles of dung, for example, are much more likely to pick up parasites. If they're again, if they are um, on the pasture for longer. So if you've got a starvation grazing or something like that and you're not able to rest it as often, there's going to be a higher build up there and therefore more parasite infection risk. But it can be also genetic. So um, particularly sheep farmers, they will have a parasite resistance is one of the heritable traits they um, will breed for. We've got a lot of different performance aspects with horses. Um, we don't really get to the parasite infection level, but it is actually, is a thing yeah. to be aware of. Anecdotally, we find that some breeds are wormier than others. So Highland ponies, um, which we have here, we know them to be wormy, but also Arabs and Frisians and other horses like that can be more susceptible and just again and, and that will be a sort of a characteristic of their um dna yeah and i think also anything that's that's potentially um lowering the immune response like stress like moving your horse around yeah. like a new home all those sort of things feed into the same the same potential to, for for all so you might worm a horse that new to it new to your yard uh, uh, but then you know it might have then a problem you know pretty quickly because it's you know, it's immune system, so it's going to be more susceptible. Yeah, all these things have an, a bearing on it for sure. So what we're really trying to do is do the testing, identify where the high egg shedders are, give the right wormers for the right horse the right time of year, and then monitor it to see if it's been effective. And that's really the key to a worming program. So right. for a healthy adult horse, that looks broadly like this, which is based on the life cycle of the parasites themselves. So the um, we've got here really looking to do something every season 
So yeah. spring, summer and autumn, getting our worm egg counts in, which is predominantly testing for our red worm and ascarid. We do see tapeworm on the worm egg counts, but it's not definitive. So we can't say you don't have it if we don't see it, if that makes sense. And yeah. this is really based on the life cycle of the small red worm, which is like four to five weeks from egg to adult. So really fast, which is why it's not simply enough to just do like, you know, we hear a lot. Oh, I well, I, I've reduced my worming by only worming twice a year. But if you're not putting any testing into that, you're still potentially leaving yourself open, which is why we really recommend the testing okay. as the thing. And then depending on the seasonality and um, late autumn, winter, we're looking at either doing that blood test, which treats or picks up those insisted redworm or doing a proactive treatment for um, your potential of insisted redworm. Right. And then over in the right hand column there, we've got our test for tapeworm, so the Equisile test. We've got that in spring and autumn every six months, um, which is based again on the life cycle of the parasite. It's slower growing, but you could do that summer or summer winter, depending yeah. on what suits you. And particularly now that we can't get Equitate Prasaquantel only over the counter, it is available from your vet. And um, so if you need it, obviously you can get it that way, but it's slightly more difficult sometimes. Yeah. Then some people will actually choose to use the saliva test in the summer and then in the winter just prior to your insisted redworm treatment. And that can help to inform, do you need the moxidectin only um, or is it a moxidectin prazoquantel combination that would be the better one? Because obviously that makes the prazoquantel easier to get a hold of. Yeah. And that and saliva then, test is really simple, isn't it, Claire, to do? It's mm. just you know, you're just holding it in, and, and the tongue is just... Um, uh, you know the saliva is coming into the horse, and then you just send it off. So it's not a difficult, a difficult thing to do. Even I. That's right. Know. Yeah, other end of the horse, and going in there with a cotton swab um, to yeah. get the saliva into the um, the cotton swab, and, and then got, that goes off. And your website has lots of videos that show how to do all that, don't they? So we do. Yes, uh, and that's um, so what I was out doing this morning as well. Um, Equiselling lots of different horses. So yeah, yeah it's, it's a really good test. Um, and then, so that's for your healthy adult horse. If you had a youngster um, or a horse that was more prone, then we just shorten the gap between those worm egg counts and we'd look at every eight weeks to begin with until we were confident that we could widen that gap. If you're seeing really good results on this and you're low risk, i.e. the horses are in closed herds and they don't go out a lot to pick up other risk from other places, then you could actually widen the gap between those further. And um, just, if, you know, it's about being confident, really, and having a couple of seasons under your belt with it. And then we look at that little purple strip underneath which is the women count reduction tests um which is what we're going to go and um have a little bit of a chat about next i think if i remember my slides right um and the advice is to do these at least annually and what these are doing is to help monitor any drug resistance so basically has the chemical been effective so we do a women count that indicates that we actually need to go in and treat the horse so we give the wormer and then 10 to 14 days after the treatment, um, then we do a second worm egg count. And what that's going to do is to measure the percentage reduction of the worm eggs that are present. And it can then identify how, where is, you know, is the resistance to the product and how much um, is there. So that's what we really need to be doing rather than blindly giving the chemicals because we need to know has it worked or not so a really good simple way of starting to test that one mm -hmm. and the other thing we're, when we're doing our targeted chemical control is testing using the right chemical so protecting those key me medicines particularly that moxidectin that we talked about really just to target those insisted stages of the small red worm and giving that once a year if we can there are some certain circumstances where we might give it more often but broadly we're reserving that for that winter dose because it's so effective against those dangerous larval stages Right. The other thing is giving sufficient worm for the weight of the horse. And I've got this little um, slide of Bertie, my island pony here. And we did a little bit of a Facebook poll about um, measuring by eye. What do we think he actually weighs? And you'll see the variable results there on the left hand side. Obviously not very technical, just a little Facebook thing. But you can see that it varied quite a lot. And um, actually, most people would have underdosed him based yeah. on the image um he was five to five kilograms in this picture i wish he was still that now but um yes. it's not all winter fluff unfortunately that he's carrying around with him but he has been out of work for a little bit unfortunately um 
but yeah, um, really, really important to get the weight right because if we don't give enough for the weight of the horse, we're just giving the worms a headache and they are giving an opportunity for them to build resistance um, faster than normal even. And then, um, which is obviously not good and we're not giving you know enough to treat them. Mm -hmm. If we are um, using a weigh bridge, that's perfect. You can get weight tapes, which have, are a pretty effective formula. Add 10% if you're going to do that, because it just then make sure that we give a sufficient dose. Um, you'll see on the estimating Bert's weight there, the weight tape was 518 kilograms. So not a long way out, but just a little bit more. And the tolerances on those wormers are, you know, they're really safe chemicals to be able to do that. So um, that's not a problem. And the other thing really, administer on a surfaced area, A to C, there's, there's not an awful lot of wormer in those actual tubes, so has there been any spit out, but also because the wormers are toxic, both to the environment, to um, our, it, in water courses and aquatic life, to beetles and things like that, but also dogs as well. Yeah. Um, you had a story about that, didn't you, Chris? Yeah, yeah, well, a friend's dog nearly got poisoned from, uh, from ingesting um... Uh, wormer so I always make yeah. sure the dogs are nowhere there and I'm, I try and do it in the stable and make sure that, that and if anybody you know it's tricky if you're in a yard and you don't know when if they're not doing it all at the same time you know you've just got to be careful if you've got your dog around around the horses you know yeah particularly collies are very um seem to be more susceptible it's ivermectin that's the most poisonous to them and uh okay. yeah but it means that then you can just deal with that um if you put it on you know if it goes on the concrete it can easily be washed away yeah get those reduction tests in and really then know where to get advice so worm is a prescription medicine they can be either prescribed by vet pharmacist or sqp or rama which is what i am which means that we've all qualified to give advice and to prescribe these particular medicines um with for um for horses farm animals um minus chickens and horses particularly um SQP stands for suitably qualified person, or we're also sometimes known now as RAMAs, which is registered animal medicines advisors. Um, all complicated, too many acronyms, but it basically means that wherever you go to buy your wormers, it's a prescription that you're getting, which is why people ask questions and want to register to know who you are, who the horse is, that right. sort of thing. But you don't stop them and sell them, do you, Claire? So there's no conflict? Not, not in the lab, no. We like to be independent in the lab because I think it's wrong that we are, could potentially be uh, doing a test and interpreting that, that the horse needs worming and then having a treatment. Then, you know, ethically, it's much easier for us to be independent and yeah. we give advice. You know, we can obviously um, have an indication of what we would... Um, suppose is the right wormer for the situation and the horse and we're very very happy to do that but we just don't sell them because we don't want to profit from you know that yeah. link really it's just yeah um, it's easier that way isn't it yeah yeah definitely yeah um and then i think um management is really the key thing and so here's me putting my money where my mouth is and doing my poo picking because we talked about these worm eggs that are getting onto the pasture in the dung and they hatch within sort of you know five six days something like that um on the pasture so really if we can be removing those at before they hatch so poo picking at least twice a week then that's really going to help us break the life cycle mechanically rather than relying on the chemicals which um, again helps to reduce the chemicals that are going in the horses better for our horses and the environment um, so really really key one keep your herds of horses stable which means that then you're not introducing new infection risks um, within that herd and resting and rotating your grazing is really key. So, you know, three months is good, six months, brilliant, a year, even better to be able to see those then um, eggs and larvae die off on the pasture and then the infection risk goes down. Mm -hmm. Slightly different if you've got a lot of young horses who might have ascarid because the ascarid eggs have actually got a real hard, sticky outer shell, which means then that um, they, they, can stay in the soil for up to 10 years um which if you've got young horses we often tend to fall down in the same field because it might be very sheltered or near to the house or the yard or whatever but actually moving that around is really going to help to lower the infection risk there to the horses and again with tapeworm we've got these grassland mites which again are much more mobile and can survive dodge in a um, very hot weather or cold by 
um, burrowing into the soil and just protecting themselves are much less likely to um, succumb to these um, warming and cooling of the extreme temperatures and um, droughts and things like that. So, um, but yeah, if for redworm, which is particularly the one we're concerned about, very, very effective to, re um, to rest even for a few months on the pasture. Okay. We're going to um, not worm and move our horses straight to fresh pasture, which can be a bit of a tricky one to get your head around. But it's all about having a um, susceptible um, collection of worms within the horse rather than favouring for a resistant population. So we're not trying to get to zero. You know, we know that the worms are all around the horses in the environment. We're just trying to minimise the high egg shedding and to keep the worms at a manageable level so we want a mixed population of worms that are susceptible um, as well as obviously some resistant that we just you know come along for the ride so if we are going to take the worms out by giving a chemical and then moving the horses straight to fresh pasture basically what we're doing is we're creating a fresh empty environment for all these um, resistant worms to then grow up and um, kind of take on world domination as resistant worms. Whereas if we can keep the horses on the same pasture for a bit longer after treatment, they're gonna get um, pick up some more of a mixed population. And once we move them in sort of 10 to 14 days time, they're gonna move with a mixed population with more susceptible as well as resistant worms within the gut. So that can be a bit of a weird one to get our head around because obviously we wanna treat them. We wanna take those worm burdens down we know we're not thinking about reinfecting themselves but actually this is what the experts are telling us that is going to give us the best chance of having treatable parasite burdens still in our horses and is that better than to wait until you've done the reduction test to see whether your worming has been affected your chemical worm has been effective in the first place yeah definitely i mean i think if you you're treating you're treating because you know you need to don't you um mm. and so yeah it, it would be great to have a weather eye on that as well um or whether you need to give a different chemical for example yeah keep them where they are for that as well okay yeah would be a good idea um and then cross grazing so yeah if we can put sheep or cattle or poultry or whatever across the fields who are going to pick up more of those eggs and larvae of the horse pa uh, parasites then that's fantastic you know that's really going to help not harrowing unfortunately we just don't have the climate in this country to make harrowing effective essentially you're just playing into the hands of the parasite by spreading the eggs and the larvae further around the pasture where they're into the from the latrines into the areas where the horse grazes on the lawns and helping to just distribute them unfortunately um and then the other thing where is quarantine. Harrowing, sorry claire where would harrowing be affected then sort of in a, in a hotter climate where the harrowing spreads the eggs and then they get desiccated by the sun or something is that the yeah exactly exactly that i think in this country generally speaking we just have too heavy a dew you know even when it's really lovely weather for it to be effective so i think you know let's focus ourselves on our poo picking and removal rather than on the um you know the the harrowing which makes things look good but it's not always the best for our parasite control unfortunately okay. unless you're obviously going to rest that field for a long time okay. and then it would be acceptable yeah and then quarantining and testing new horses so just making sure then that anything that's coming in isn't bringing with it a whole host of parasites to infect the herd and you know introducing that challenge so um that would be another key one to do really so yeah. and all this is helping just to buy us time because we really are heading for wormer resistance becoming a massive problem in our horses if we don't change what we're doing you know, the research from 2018 um that we've got from the british equine veterinary association says that in 2018 we did um for every one wormer count they sold 11 wormers so it's really the wrong way around you know we need to be testing first and then only treating the ones that we know we need to um so we definitely need to normalize sending away our horse's poo in the post and um, getting the lab testing done on it rather than just reaching for the chemical which is easy so yes. but what have we got in the future so we've got this saliva test for insisted small red women development which is really going to help to make that more available and allow more people to skip even their winter wormer 
So reducing the number of chemicals. We're going to look at refining worm egg count use as well. I think we're going to start to see the number of um, eggs per gram rise in a low risk course uh, before we treat. So currently with the worm egg counts, we're looking at a 200 eggs per gram where uh, and above where we step in with the treatment. But we do know of many places that successfully use 500 and um, even the donkey sanctuary, which have a lot of problem with resistance, they don't step in with treatment now till over a thousand eggs per gram. So, um, oh. but that's really then monitoring the horse in front of you, the health of it. And if you've got a healthy adult equine, then um, they are more resilient to parasite infection. And so we might start to see that rise and again, then reduce the chemical use that we've got. Focusing on our management, so you know more poo picking, more muck heap, um, kind of good practice. Other ways that we can start to reduce that mechanically on pasture um, is definitely key. And then what have we got really coming along? There's no chemicals in development, so um, but we know that there are, for example, people looking into tannins, and we've known a long time that things like sanfoin, which is a forage. Um, I believe simple systems have a pelleted version of it. They've used that a long time for horses, cattle, other grazing animals to help suppress parasite and um, infection, as well as obviously it being a really good forage um, for certain situations. But the thing is with these, there's no current licensing for them. So there's just this kind of herbal kind of knowledge that comes through. Other things like fungi, again, they can be really beneficial in reducing parasite infection and creating environments within the gut that are aren't um you know make it less um hospitable to these um, parasites so that's another thing that's being explored but the stability of these products for commercial sale and the palatability like how do they package them how do they then get a dosage rate for them and license them because licensing costs an awful lot of money you know we're talking millions um then these are all things that we need to overcome in order to start to introduce these but at least there is work being done um which you know we really need this because um like i say otherwise we really are in trouble so we've just got to think about um not just our own horse in our herd but we know that we have to treat herds together because they're a dynamic thing with parasite infection and egg shedding affecting the whole herd we've got to think about the environment because these are like these toxin toxins are um that the metabolites are coming from the wormers um are really bad for our environment so how can we reduce the impact of those um both on our horses but also on our um our fields our dung beetles our micro flora and fauna in our water systems i mean all these sorts of things mm -hmm. um you know, so it's about the wider horses, but and it's for every horse from cobs to competition horses. But really, it's our future. You know, if we're going to carry on keeping horses and on the land that we have done for so long, we really do need to absolutely act now. So really, my challenge to you guys is like, you know, what do we do when the wormers stop working? You know, we cannot wait to find out. Mm -hmm. And if it's time to worm, we need to be testing first and only treating the ones um, that actually really need it. So yeah absolutely Claire. i mean and that and that's just absolutely key isn't it absolutely it is yeah yeah well that's been fantastic um and thank you know what a, lo a load of information you've got there that you can share and uh, and there's so much more on your website because that's uh, uh which gives you a lot more background stuff but i uh, yeah i mean there are a few things there that i haven't really thought about you know um so i'm very happy that uh, i've got a bit more knowledge now <laughs> try not to yeah, go uh, forward and do your testing. Yeah, I, know. I know, and even even when I know you're there, and I'm and I'm always trotting down the road with the worm thing. I still don't. I'm still not, you know, religiously regular. I know some people are very good about putting on the calendar, you know, really doing it in a structured fashion. And I know that you keep the record, so it's because I get a reminder from you. I know that I need. I get a text that says your horse needs a, a worm count. Then I know to go and do it. So you, you know you're offering that that sort of good service in that sense that you're sort of like triggering the action on on our behalf, which I think is brilliant. Yeah, we've got our reminder system. We also have a subscription for people who really do struggle because I mean the three months come around, comes around so mm. fast that we can then just send the tests out when you need it, and you just do them and return them which again is you're just trying to make it as easy as possible you know we've done a lot of work on our test kits on our service and on making it as straightforward as possible to do the testing and 
because yeah the difficulty is you know it's so easy just to reach for a wormer and put it in and yeah it's okay it might work now but it's just this impact of down the line really that um yeah. you know what the parasitologists are telling us is we need to aim to be giving two or less wormers to each horse every year and when we look at that on balance that we're going to really need to give younger and older horses a lot more that means our adult horses really you know if we can get them down to this one insisted red worm treatment or um even potentially none at all if we're able to do the red worm blood test mm -hmm. then like that's going to go an awful long way to getting us um you know some time for these other treatments to come on board so yeah yeah, yeah. it's a, a key one mm -hmm. and i know you've been um you know because it is so uh you know you've tried so much to reduce the waste for the for you know the kits that you send out and everything Claire you know so they're compostable so I know we you know we get the tray we get loads of all this compostable stuff coming in that turns up in the poo trailer when we're picking up poo so yeah you I know a passion project of mine yeah, yeah it's all about the environment yeah and composting yeah. it here on the farm so yeah um but yeah if anyone has any questions very very happy to answer them um or you can you know get in touch with us and um you know on our facebook page or email telephone um to talk about your individual situations or anything else i'm very happy to answer those if people have their wormy questions and want them answered yeah that's brilliant claire thanks very much for that and if anything comes up um subsequently on the feed then i'll i'll uh, come through to you and uh, and we can find a response so thank you so much for uh, all the effort you've done there and uh yeah, let's uh, let's all get testing and make sure that we can keep our horses safe for as long as possible. Thanks very much, no Diane. Worries. Thank you for having me. Thank you. Yeah. Take care now. Bye. 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 Thank you. Bye.